catch up on all the live shows right here on africatechradio.com. If you're in Nigeria, words like election, tech, PVC, online registration, BVAS, portal, IREV are some of the most popular terms from the 2023 general elections that you will not forget in a hurry. The use of technology in Nigeria's electoral system did not start today or in the build up to the 2023 general elections. Tech, they say, has always had a place in the elections. Some examples would be the use of the direct data capture method for voter registration in 2007, which um, aimed to eliminate double registration, double voting, and other electoral practices. And, well, it was judged partly successful. Another case would be the use of automated fingerprint identification system in 2011 with the aim of introducing a digital register and erasing double registration. In 2015, the PVC, Permanent Voters Card and Smart Card Reader Technology, if you were there at that time, you'd remember this. It was introduced to minimize election fraud and rigging. In 2020, the ANEC Result Viewing Portal, IREV, which aimed to enable Nigerians view polling unit results in real time as voting ends on election day, was announced. And finally, on my list would be the Bimodal Voter Accreditation System, BVAS, which was introduced to eliminate identity thefts that's uh, using another person's permanent voters card on election day. Today, we're talking about the role of technology and the impact of technology in Nigeria's election, especially the 2023 general elections. And I have the innovation officer at Iaga Africa, Samuel Folorenshaw, the head political desk, mainland FM Lagos, Okpemi Akinode, and elections lead at CJID Mboho Eno. I hope I said these names correctly. Well, let's start the discussion. And we're starting with Samuel. Samuel, I hope I said your name correctly. Samuel, follow and show. Okay, that's very beautiful. So, Samuel, let's start with your thoughts post election on how, just generally, in like one thought or one breath, how much of an impact did using you know tech had on the election from the process you know to the outcome okay good morning nigerians yeah um, so generally uh technology played a very huge role in, in the just concluded general elections in the country and while i would say technology played a rude role because i won't be looking at it from just the election day process alone i will be looking at it from the pre-election voter registration how nigerians engage with using technology and voter education across it mainly the, the use of social media so technology played a very huge role and i will rate I will, and i will rate that technology use of technology about 80 percent in these elections hmm. okay um Okay, me. Would you do as much as eighty percent? And I hope that's the right uh, pronunciation of your name. Please help us say your name correctly. Okay, yeah, you pronounce it well. My name is Okoyemi Akinyede, actually, so you got it very well. Okay, so would you still say that you know eighty percent tech's involvement in this election, the twenty twenty three election, looking at you know in hindsight from when we started with voter education and registration up until voting and coalition and result announcement? I, I think Samuel was just being generous with his smack. If he happens to be my lecturer, I'll be passing very well in his class. <laughs> uh, for real, I, I think 80% is, um, well, it depends on where you're looking at it from. I was privileged to be a part of the whole electoral process, uh, the sensitization for the continuous voter registration, the sensitization for collection of PVC, the sensitization for voters' education from INEC, from NGOs, the media. So it's it's something I really had a first time information about. And um, if you look at it, especially the weight of expectations that we had on INEC, I think we could have done way better than we did. So for me, I, I think, well, the case are still at the tribunal. So it depends on what comes out of it. My, my rating could even drop further uh, once these cases start coming up. So for now, I think the fifty percent is just fine. Hmm. Okay, okay, that's fine. Mboho, how much of an impact or how much of an effect do you think you know tech had on you know the process, the outcome, and what would you rate you know that process and outcome? 
Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Nigerians and listeners outside Nigeria. I won't rate the involvement of tech like Okoyemi and uh, Samuel have done. I would just probably say uh, generally tech was uh, played a critical role in this election. One, we've mentioned it from the point of voters' registration to the point of PVC collection, to elections, actual elections itself. And interestingly, most of the cases in courts right now is still bothered around technology. So played a very central and critical role. That's all I would say. And the the effect is what we're still feeling even up to today. Mm. So if if we did a lot in the area of voter education and you know the numbers were you know they increased when it comes to when it came to registration the numbers we saw and collection of pvcs when we look at the numbers from the election knowing that we still had you know some form of voter apathy or low voter turnout on the day of election what do you think we need to do better in terms of voter education staying with umboho here I think we just continue to deploy technology, more sensitization, more grassroots sensitive platforms, not to elit- elitist uh, technology, because we have more voters at the grassroots who may not be so technologically savvy. So we might need to re- come up with technologies that can do with kind of, that can, people can relate with kind of using simple text messaging, because some of the people at the grassroots level do not get to use the kind of Android phones that people in the cities use. It might just be uh, a very small phone that can easily make and receive calls. We might need to deploy technologies like that, technologies that can use. Like there was a time, I don't know, I stopped it on my own phone, but I know there were these times you just sit and you get a call from Airtel or any of these mobile uh, telecoms provider talking to you about the services that offer and all of that. We might want to consider such kinds of messaging for the grassroots uh, mobilization. So basically, we just need to, yes, continue to deploy technology, but we need to be sensitive so that we carry each and every segment of the nation of the voters along. Okay, now, Okoyemi, do you think that the rave we had on social media do you think that this rave you know is just like a twitter thing and in real life in reality that level of voter education you know doesn't exist to start with i really appreciate one particular opinion that mo actually came up with and that's the fact that um, we need to find a way to reduce the level of sophistication uh, in tech related campaign engagement what i mean is that we need to know that every single voter are not at the same wavelength in terms of access to information, in terms of their ability to understand how tech works. I mean, I covered the entire Lagos during the presidential and the uh, gubernatorial election, and there were places in Lagos, as much as we expect, well, Lagos is a mega city, is a, is a cosmopolitan city. There were areas in Lagos where people were still taught how to put their fingerprint on the beavers. In Lagos here, elderly people didn't have an idea of how those things work. Places like El Ibubu in Ikodu, for instance, places like Ayobo, like the inner side of those areas, it's still in this same Lagos. So I totally agree with what he said. We need to, yeah, as much as we want to have a tech-driven election process where we can bring some level of sanity, into our electoral processes. I think we need to know that 65% of the voters that we have in this country are people outside of the regular catchment areas where you think there's internet, Twitter can reach out to them, Facebook posts can reach out to them and all of that. So we need to do that. Now talking about the social media, I'm so happy to be alive at this time. I think a lot of people are beginning to realize that truly social media can be for social good. In 2019, for instance, the Labour Party presidential candidate had about 5,000 plus in the whole election. 5,000 plus. Now, the candidate of the Labour Party in this election had over 6 million votes. And whether you like it or not, the role that social media played in this last election across board, irrespective of a political divide. I mean, the, the, uh, the fact that we're able to reach out to some of these politicians via their social media handles to have them in the studio for interview, 
uh, to run online interview with them shows that the social media was really key in how the people maybe not necessarily have a political ideology being thrown out but it helped the people to have an idea like okay we can actually get this right we can, i mean there were times in this country where you would see politicians during election going around eating corn by the roadside you know going to places where they are plating air like they just did those ridiculous things but it looks like the fact that they know that they will most likely be exposed on social media and they'll be dragged in court means that there were there were less of those shenanigans in this last election so the social media really played a vital role yes information dissemination we could do more in quotes again fake news we can do more because i remember one incident that happened on the day of the governorship election i covered the polling unit of the president elect at the apc candidates and then i was there when he arrived in the company of his wife and his daughter and when they cast the ballots i mean of course pictures were everywhere news it, it was trending and people were bringing up the fact that those pictures were snapped on the 22nd of february 2022 or there about and people were really really sure that those pictures were fake and i was like guys this was the only any decide shop right at alausa i covered this look at video look at pictures like and people were still saying no it's a fake one he didn't vote he didn't do that so what i'm trying to say is that the social media played a very big role in terms of information dissemination let me not lie to you i know a lot of people that got fools because they want to be on Twitter, they want to follow election conversations. So it played a big role. But yet again, we can still do more. Okay, thank you. And Samuel, Akwemi thinks we can do more. Mboho thinks we can do more. When we look at, you know, the numbers, registration, and the numbers that went out <coughs> to actually collect their PVCs, what do you think we can do in this area? Maybe using less sophisticated technology to reach out to more people. Do you think the way we handled it for this election worked? What do you think can be improved? What we looked at internally at the Aga Africa was to look at, one, how do we reach the inner cities, the people that could not access technology, that could not access internet. So one of the things we did was to build a low-tech service, which where you can basically send the name of your ward and the name of your local government, then you, we will send you back the collection address for PVCs. And I think the commission and the other, other stakeholders in this election, in our electoral process, should encourage and embrace this kind of technology because it's not everybody that is reachable, as Mbo rightly said, by WhatsApp or by Twitter. So we have to look at the low tech opportunities, low tech areas like the use of SSD, use of SMS based services to reach the inner cities. And if we look at the turnout of this election against the total number of people that registered, I think there's also another factor at play here which means now we are now beginning to see the true shape of our voter resistance going back we are now seeing a true value of accredited voters and that is why i was really 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 not happy with the with the electoral commission when they did not push push the total number of accredited voters on IREF on election day so because we are beginning to see the true picture and the state state of, of our voter register so by the use of technology in voter education i think we need to embrace more low tech because when for for instance in in, in yaga africa we developed the my election body chatbot where you can chat with this my election body on whatsapp and you get instant responses to questions electoral questions and also the list of people running running for elections and so on so you can still check it out the my election body chatbot is still alive so people need to embrace more low tech initiative to reach the people that needs to be rich mm. okay now something i noticed personally Thank yeah, thank you, Samo. Uh, just still with you, Samo. Something I noticed personally during the CVR drive, the continuous voter registration drive, was the issue of double registration. In my head, I'm thinking, is it not possible for someone who wants to register again to not be registered instead of registering and then, you know, the issue of double registration, you know, comes up? What do you think about this? Okay, so around the issue of double registration, um, the Electoral Commission look at it in a certain way. One, prior to for the introduction of Beavers, there, there is something we call, they use, which is the smart card reader, which is the fingerprint technology they were basically using. So there were a lot of a lot of records on, on, on the Commission's register database that are invalid because people a lot of people had issues, usually have issues with their thumbprints not being captured. So that's why they left the registration open. So in, instead of confusing Nigerians, they allow everybody to register so they can practically update some of the records and also 
renew some of these people's records. So prior to that, then we start seeing a lot of people trying to take advantage of the system, people trying to register multiple times. And technology really played a big role in helping them fish out this huge number. Over 2.7 million double registrations was it, what they, they were able to dictate in that exercise. Mm. Okay, um, Boho, what do you think about this? Do you think we should be talking about double registration as an issue for voters? Or, uh, do you think that maybe uh, we can just have an automated system where nobody even gets to the point where you know, they would even have double registration. Thank you, Anthony. I mean, just as Summer was saying, I think that decision lies with INEC. But uh, I think one other thing that we've done, we did with that double registration, uh, with the re- registration of voters during the last enrollment exercise was that the file data of people were, were updated. And that goes up to the point of helping the commission stay up to date with its voters register. But I also want to add that I think we should be moving towards a consolidation of the point in this country where we consolidate all the data collected at various ministries, departments and agencies. For instance, right now you want to get your driver's license, you need to go through the data capturing process. You get to the bank, you want to update your BVN, you have to go through the data capturing process, the national identity, you have to capture data there as well. So I think we need to move to the point where, as a country, we begin to consolidate all the databases that the country has. And then we can have a much more simplified registration process so that as citizens are hitting 18 years, is automatically update the, the dashboard that we have. And we also need to get to a point where we take the registration seriously. Right now, I, I don't think there is a registry where people uh, get to register for people that are dead or something. We have, out of the 93 million vote, registered voters, I'm almost very sure that we have some people who are no more alive in that register. So we could continue to put uh, throughout the figures 93 million and then we look at just 27 million came out to vote but that's not the reality what's the reality the reality on the ground is that we have people who are no longer alive or who have at some point maybe changed citizenship or something we need to be able to clean up the, the, the register and for us to be able to do proper cleaning of the register we need to have with a commission or whatever it is that ensures that there is proper data capturing at the point of birth and at the point of death so that our national data can be in a proper shape. And when we throw out the figure, we know that actually in reality, this is what we have. Until we get to that point, I think just consolidation across board is what we should be looking at. Yeah, I I agree. And I also think that we should also be putting into consideration those who are moving out of Nigeria and the number keeps increasing. Thank you. Now, Umbo, still with you, the cost of elections in Nigeria has been on the front burner for years and it keeps getting much more expensive and expensive every year. When we look at monitoring spend, do we even monitor spend, campaign spend in Nigeria? Do we do that by major parties and by candidates? And, you know, what role will technology play in ensuring that we effectively you know monitor campaign spend in nigeria by parties and by candidates thank you the last two years prior to the 2023 elections the center for journalism innovation and development projects called the media in national elections have been trying to get data of spending in the 2019 general election and we had the opportunity of having the INEC chairman have a citizen's interruption on the 4th of June, 2022. At that meeting, I remember I asked the INEC chairman, by law, all political parties should have submitted, using the 2010 Electoral Act, should have submitted all their audited accounts for elections, campaigns, financing, and all of that, six months after the election. And as at the time we were having this conversation, it was already about three years after the election. And I asked the INEC chairman, as what data does the regulatory agency of political parties 
have on spending of political parties and spending of candidates. Interestingly, no audited accounts of political parties have been done as at that time since 2018. And we're preparing to enter another election cycle. And don't forget that earlier in the year, the 2022 Electoral Act had increased spending for campaigns and political parties and all of that. So if we do not even have an idea of how much was spent in the video past, we are not even asking for data. Interestingly, let me also shock you all. We had done an FOI request to INEC requesting for data of political party spending for 2011, 2015, and 2019 elections. As I speak to you now, we have not gotten a feedback. What we got, what I got in the form of a feedback was that a, a, a director called me and said, oh, it, it cannot assure us that uh, we will get any 2015, any 2011 data because the INEC chairman now was not the INEC chairman then. And while we were on that call, I asked him, are you saying that INEC does not have records? I now asked a follow-up question. I was like, are you saying that when Professor Jagger was leaving, he went away with the data and I didn't get a feedback. So until we get to the point of the regulatory agency, in this case, being INEC, living up to its expectation, it will be difficult to monitor campaign spending. Don't forget that these political parties also are very secretive and they will do anything to make sure that you don't have access to their own uh, spending and all of that. But these are supposed to be public information that are available on their portal, but we don't have them. It's the same that should be for INEC. We should, their audited account should be available to citizens on the INEC platform. But because there is no proactive disclosure, it makes the deployment of FOI inevitable. And in the deployment of FOI, they can decide either to comply or not to comply. And the question is, how many CSOs have the, le- the, the resources to the FOI access after a reminder of certain days you can sue them? How many CSOs have the resources to sue a government organization or institution? So the tech, we need tech, yes, to begin to be able to, as political parties are spending, they're updating. But then we also need to have, introduce punitive measures so that if you fail to meet up with uploading X, Y, Z at this point in time, the sanctions are into full effect. Right now, even the regulatory agency is not wielding that power. So we cannot have an actual picture of what the spending on elections is at the moment. I doubt if INEC, as I'm talking to you now, I've gotten an audited, they've been able to audit political parties of, I mean, for 2019 elections. And if we have not been able to trace our step from, if we don't have a past to compare this year, it will be difficult to make regulations and rules that will favor Nigerians in the near future. Thank you very much for that. Now, Okpeyemi, you mentioned something very interesting, which is misinformation. How much greater misinformation did we have leading into the 2023 (coughs) general elections? How much of it did you notice? Do we need to have regulations that would help tone down the misinformation we have on social media? And also, while you are monitoring the elections in Lagos for the presidential and the governorship and others, did Beavers really make any difference? Oh, I must give you a lot of credit to the last speaker, Nashi Bimbo, as regards the issue of asking, you know, the right questions. I also remember around November last year, um, I had a program somewhere in one of the hotels in Ikeja, and um, I attended. And that was one of the questions I asked the INEC chairman. When President Mamoni Barry signed the Electoral Act in 2022, March, I think, the restrictions for presidential candidates were pegged at five billion for governorship i think it was maybe one billion or thereabouts for senate i think 300 million or thereabouts and it was clearly stated that the account was represented by the political parties by the political parties 
But the question is this, how do I hold the political party to account when the candidate are the ones financing the political parties? How would the party chairman even ask the candidates where they got the source of their monies from? I, in 2016, I've, I've actually been following the US elections for a while, and specifically in 2016, when former President Donald Trump ran against former first lady, that's Hillary Clinton, I remember there was something that was released then as regards to how much donations came in. And I was going through it and I saw the LGBTQ society, I saw the gun, uh, national uh, gun regulatory agency, and I saw the way everybody, you know, they were able to account for how much every single person, individual organization, even religious organization, how much everyone contributed. It was well documented. But look at what we have in Nigeria. Nobody cares about how much is being spent, and people often forget. Election does not start on the day the voting starts. Election starts from the point where you've gone to indicate your interest to contest for any political party or political office. It continues where you pick up your nomination form. It continues from where you go for consultations, you are visiting, you are going for the presidency, you are covering all of the PDC state and the FCT. If for the governorship, you are visiting the local government and the wards in your state. If it's for the Senate, you are covering all of the, uh, you know, constituencies that your senatorial district covers. So it's a big process. And all of this process involves money. You visit the religious leaders, you drop something where you are going. You visit the traditional rulers, you drop something where you are going. You visit every opinion leader, the youth leader, the market women, every interest group. You drop something where you are going. All of these monies are supposed to be accounted for. Now, we move away from there. On the day of the primaries, unfortunately, I think Nigeria has one of the most complicated democratic systems in the world, where we have a selected few that are called the delegates, make decisions for which about 100 million people will eventually go and vote for. That's really contradicting. It's almost like the electoral system in the U.S., where you can win the public vote for as much as 4 or 5 million if you don't win the electoral college you don't get declared, just like we saw in Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. So it's really confusing to me that why would some people delegate, tailored list, doctored list by party chairman, party hierarchy, they will go into a room after there are rumors of money being exchanged. I was at the APC primaries, and I can tell you for a fact, I mean, this could be on record, I can tell you for a fact that the minute you go to that Eagle Square, the venue of the convention, you could literally smell money. I'm sure you I'm sure you guys understand what I'm saying. So that's another process. So we need to sit ourselves down and ask if you're really serious about the democracy we're practicing in this country. It's unfortunate because you and I know that until we continue to deal with what we have, you can literally predict where the election is going to. I was privileged to interview a lot of presidential candidates in the last election, but you and I know that the conversation centered around Atiko back of the PDP, Peter Obi of the Labour Party, Rabbi Musun Kwakwasa of the New Nigerian People's Party, and the development Tinubu of the ruling APC. Maybe in between, there's Adebayo of SDP, Shore of AAC, you know, just a couple of people. You and I know that despite the fact that we had about 18 political parties, just four people were at the front runner of this electoral campaign, and the conversation centered around them. So we need to open the conversation more. Okay, now let's talk to the issue of the beavers. I can tell you one thing today, Anthony. The beavers worked. I can, I can, and I can tell you again. The beavers worked for the last time. The beavers worked. Now, there were times in this country where dead people would be recorded to have voted in election in this country. There were places that I covered in the last election. I didn't just cover Lagos. My station was, you know, we were able to build enough contact to have contact in almost all of the 36 states that were giving us instant feedback as the things were going on. Now, there were places in this that we covered where the voter register had about 750. And by the time the result was being announced, only 94 people got read by the beavers. That means only 94 people voted. Before now, whether you call for beavers or you don't call for beavers, <laughs> whoever is in that zone, get all of the 700 votes. <laughs> in fact, at the polling unit of the president elect, I think the voter registered there was about 718 at Alausa. By the time the result was being announced, less than 100 people got votes in that. No, less than 100 people came out to vote in that place. 
The reason is that it is not the residential area, it's the secretariat. So a lot of people voted, a lot of people registered in that place, but they couldn't come to that place to vote. So ordinarily, before now, in 2003, 2007, 2011, all the 718 registers on that vote have gone to the, to the owner of that zone. I'm sure you guys understand what I'm saying. So if I say the giver, the givers works, I think he did. Maybe not perfectly, but he did. In terms of reducing overvoting, reducing stolen identity, people come to polling unit to vote with other people's PVCs. People come to polling unit to vote and they tell you that, oh, the last letter of my, my, my PVC picture is, is not clear, but the numbers are here. The moment you get to where the beavers is, the data you have there is what is going to come out. It's very simple. So the beavers did you work. See, let's just say with ourselves. There are times that even you have network on your phone, but you still can't make calls. You have data on your phone, you still cannot access internet. So tech is not a given. It's not a, 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 function, a function that is cast in stones. It's not something that cannot have fall. So the beavers could have his own issues. For instance, there was a place I covered in a cartoon, but then we got there around three o'clock. The voting had ended. They've already done the sorting. They've done the counting. All of the party agents were just there, sitting with the ad hoc staff, gisting and all of that. Only 41 people voted in that place. And they had a voter register of about 340 or there about like over 300. Only 41 people voted. Ordinarily, they will have called the ad hoc staff, the INET person, the NYC member. So yeah, give party A 40 uh, ballot paper. Give party B 9 unused ballot paper. Oh yeah, complain for your party, complain for party. These are the things that I've seen. It's not something I just fabricated. These are the things I've been covering elections since 2011. So we've seen all of these things. We've seen them on videos. People post them. So we have to see all of this. So did the members work? Yes, he did. But let's be sincere with ourselves. I think a lot of people are mis that misunderstand. Uh, let me say that train they don't understand the difference between the beavers and the iron. The iron is where the problem is. The beavers' job is to capture you. Oh yeah, put your face, snap picture. I enter your database. I confirm that oh, this is Anthony. Oh, this is Samuel. Oh, this is Mbo. Oh, this is Obani. Everybody runs with that. You vote and you go. The job of the iron is to transmit that result from that point, straight into the central server of ILEC, and that's where the job is done. We sometimes complicate issues in this country. In 2016, my dad was in Nigeria, and he voted for the US presidential election in Nigeria. He mailed in his vote. He was in Nigeria in November, and we're just in the center, was like, I want to vote. And I was like, okay, I put out the internet for him, and he voted right in this place. So I think the bigger win for tech is that Apart from consolidation that Mbo talked about, I mean, one of the most unfortunate things in this country is the fact that we have multiplication of identity. You have voter's card, you have national ID card, you have PVC or whatever, you have international passport, you have driver's license. What are we doing with all of these things for goodness? <laughs> what are we doing with all of these things? And still, they will tell you that uh, they cannot get one information, they cannot capture. Why don't we align with the banks? I can tell you something for a fact, guys. The best place you can get authentic information from Nigerians has to be the bank. People don't joke with their money. People hardly give fake phone numbers at the banks. <laughs> so it's very easy for us to get all of these things done. True. So we can consolidate on these little gains that we have. I really, really like the fact that we are bringing tech into the election. Tech is not safe, absolutely. I mean, people will probably want to hack all of these things, alter the figures, hijack the process and all of that. But we can continue to develop, we can continue to build, we can continue to make progress so that we don't take one step forward and 20 steps backward. The divas did his job in this election. Was it perfect? No. Did he do the job? Yes. That's just the thing, sir, Anthony. Okay, okay, thank you. Now, Samuel... Beavers, IREV, do we need more tech intervention in coalition verification and maybe result announcement? Or do we just need more people who we can trust in that process? Yeah, good question, Anthony. And I will take it right from where Okwayemi stopped. Yes, we, we definitely do not need more, more technology to be introduced. We just need to improve on the ones we have and when the uh, yemi said um, beavers worked yes beavers truly worked where we had issues and hiccups with was the IRF. 
for instance so for for instance an election on the president day of the presidential election on, on the 25th of february i was stunned because there were live updates being carried out by by the commission tech team on irf changes being made and it it just goes against every every practice of 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 using a technology in 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 a live deployment it it goes against every practice because you can't be making changes or developing change, uh, making changes on on a technology that is being used for an election as important as an election is in this country so we, we necessarily do not need to introduce new technologies yes maybe there should be more technologies around pvc collections reaching out to voters registered voters to come get their pvcs because that's one of one of the place where I need drop the ball in the use of use of technologies. So because because why can you say you are able to contact people that are registered for their for their voter's card and they gave you their phone numbers. So those that's one of the places where we can improve on or maybe we need to introduce a form of um, information management system that can immediately reach the registered voters and to inform them that their voter's card is ready for collection. And in, even in the long run, let's talk about voter's card. Voter's card is something that will be a thing of the past going forward because if you look at how the beavers operate, the beavers does not have any business interacting interacting with the voter's card. So you just need to, as a voter, know the last six digits of your VIN and present yourself for accreditation. So in the, in the long run, I'm, I can, I'm sure civil society organizations are going to take this up and advocate for the total eradication of the, of the voter's card. So to your question again, um, there's, we need to just improve on, on the technologies that are currently available. The IREV was a great improvement from what, we, from what we saw in the presidential election on the day of the governorship elections across the country. We saw it, it works more faster, more efficiently. So the, the commission needs to, need to be more transparent in their dealings on the IREV because a lot of unanswered questions are still there as to what happened to the IREV on, on the presidential election day. Okay. Now, Mboho, this is us reviewing ourselves, you know, civil society, media organizations, NGOs, and, you know, all of those within that space. Did we do enough in using tech tools to watch the vote or to monitor the process? And what areas can we improve upon? Thank you, Anthony. I I think media actually deployed a lot of technology during the entire process. Same with CSO, you get to see, especially, let me just draw our attention to this. Post the 25th election, post the presidential election, you saw a lot of civil society going to town, trying to come up with portals, uploading portals, so that we can also help INEC, I mean, to hold INEC accountable to citizens. This is like the best innovation that can happen to any country when your civil society is active and alive to its responsibilities we noticed a gap and within a period of two three weeks there was there were alternative provisions if you go through the technology space you will notice at least to me i am aware of at least three portals that were built within that period to checkmate whatever INEC was coming up with. So I would say that as build up from the period of voter registration, voter education and all of that, building up to the actual elections, the media was up and running in terms of sensitization, bringing updates, even when some voters were having challenges with getting their PVCs or getting registered. The media was alive to its responsibility and I want to say there is absolutely nothing more that the media could have done at that point more than that. But going forward, what can the media and civil society do? For civil society, I think we also need to be preemptive, not responsive. Assuming that there was a platform before the February 25th, 2023 elections that was also encouraging citizens to upload results from PU level. I'm sure most of the talks we are having now would have been reduced because there would have been an alternative to getting verifiable results. Don't get me wrong, civil societies did the best they could by uh, crowdsourcing 
information from social media. For instance, the CGID right from 2015 will be using the hashtag snap and send to get our citizens to send results from their polling units so that we can access and kind of also create results that are being shared on social media. But it's getting to a point where we need to also think ahead so that we can fill in gaps. It's beginning to look like the government agencies that we have been asked that we've put in place to bring about transparency and credibility uh, seems not to be leaving too much to its responsibility. I mean, look at every aspect of the nation right now. It's when citizens have so much hope and expectation, that's when that particular agency or, uh, or regulator does not live, to ex- uh, live up to expectation. So I think we, we get into the point where we need to have, begin to have alternatives. Yes, we, by law, it's only INEC that can declare results. But there is no law that says citizens cannot decide to collect authentic results from polling units somewhere. You are not declaring. You just been Yaga is doing the PVT. We learned a few things from their own post election reports. One of the things that that helped to do was to help draw INEX attention to the fact that in Imo and in Rivers, according to the Yaga PVT, INEC did not live up to its responsibility. And that's the kind of thing we need to encourage at a national scale so that we do not get back to this point where we have to be put in a fix without an alternative. So the media needs to be proactive. The issues of campaign financing, political party financing, the issues of candidates nomination and on selection needs to be at the front burner of conversation and we need the media to lead that conversation we need a media that is committed to transparency in the electoral process that can stand and and ask the difficult questions questions that the politicians themselves don't want to hear i mean by the time we get to that level where we begin to get some accountability media into taking lead on some of these conversations we will still continue to have these challenges that we are having right now so let's get to the point where civil societies within the space of election can effectively harmonize their their programming and engage media for specific interventions interventions of transparency in campaign financing interventions in understanding candidate nomination. By the way, Bayelsa, Kogi, and Imo party primaries are going to be coming up within the next month, across almost across all the political parties. We need to begin to focus on the selection process of these political parties. And we need to also draw lessons, bring out the good, the bad, the ugly to the fore, and have the conversations on a way to mo- go forward. I think that's what the media can do. And of course, the CS goes. Thank you. Mm, thank you very much. I would take that as your closing statement on the places where we need to improve upon. Um, except if you want to add one or two. So we all have one minute now to speak to the areas that moving forward, we need to improve upon. The areas that, for example, there's a president elect. And we have governors elected, elected officials across the country. What's the next step in holding them accountable through the tech tools that, you know, show that these things that we've talked about can be done and we can replicate them, you know, on a national scale. Mboho, do you want to make any other comments or should we just go to Samoa and Okoyemi? Okay, thank you. I I think on a final note, I think we need to begin to attach punishments to and actually be seen to be to be dispensing sanctions to people or political parties and supporters that have aired. Uh, we have an electoral act that says you should not use ethnicity or religion to campaign. And during the last elections, we saw political parties that deployed that strategy. So the question is, what's the, what's the police, what are the security agencies, what are, what's INA going to do to sanitize that the, that process. We need to 
before we can look forward with the needs to we need to do a review to have some punishments meted out to those people to serve as a deterrent and this is where i call for on the ninth national assembly or possibly the tenth national assembly to expedite the action on the bill of on creation of electoral offenses commission i think that will go a whole a long way in helping cater for some of these irresponsibilities Thank you very much, Mbo. Samuel, one minute, and then Okoyemi. Thank you, Anthony Higgins. So to, to look at areas where we can improve or continue to improve this our electoral process, I'll focus on mainly areas of tech. So now that we are having an, a government change, a new president elect, so we need to continue to, to hold all these elected officials accountable. One, one of the major things we, we need to start looking at is develop tech tools where they can track these people's and contribution on the floor of the house, like track the bills they are introduced into the house, track track the contributions they are making, so that citizens can know what their representatives are doing for them. So this helps promote transparency. It also helps promote engagement of citizens because if you can, if you see a bill introduced by your by your lawmaker to the house, you could you could easily engage. You could easily go to your lawmaker and say, no, this is this bill is not in our interest. This bill you are supporting is not is not what we have we that voted for you want. So we need to continue to track these elected officials' activities as going forward so that we can continue to hold them accountable. At least one of the positives we positives from the just completed election is that the politicians now know that people are becoming more aware. People are now vote, not voting along party lines anymore. People are now voting along candidacy along they are now interested in the people they are voting for that's why we can see in the presidential election a lot of states went in a certain direction and the presidential election and the governorship election is not the same for those states that states that have gone the way they, they went in the presidential election so it's it, it, it's interesting to see how we can continue to introduce technological to to help help citizens engage engage with their legislatures and the people they've elected into office thank you Mm, okay, I look forward to that too. Okay, Amy, closing words. Well, I think I would want to come in from this point. And one thing a lot of people often fail to realize is that when we share information, when we exchange ideas, it helps the job to get really easier. Now, I, I enjoyed the conversation this morning. Uh, probably one or two of the people that I've met, I've actually never met them before. What that means is that we should see the progress of this country as a collective responsibility. Fine, we may be competing in a small space. Everybody's looking for the market and all of that. But we'll always have to know that this country is paramount. This, you could have all of the passport, job, triple citizenship. It's okay. But at the end of the day, are going to be addressed as a Nigerian American first before any other thing. So in the, the issue of you know information sharing, data sharing, having conversations like this, you want to have for instance, um, an awareness program. I have the media space, I have the platform. You can reach out, oh, Alpha, let me give you 10 minutes of my airtime. Let me allow you to sell your ideas. We can always, you know, consolidate ideas. We can always cross fertilize ideas, bring each other together. Oh, you have a platform, you have an app that can reach out to a couple of people. Okay, give me about 100 people set up around this place. These are the people I'm trying to reach out to as a radio station. So if we can exchange ideas like this, we can always make progress on this. So that this conversation does not just end on a Zoom podcast like this. We can always keep it going. The need for partnerships. Thank you very much, Samuel for Lauren Shaw, the Innovation Officer at Yaga Africa. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. And I hope that, you know, it doesn't stop here. We would, you know, continue to work together to ensure that what Mboho said about um, building that space where we can all hold ourselves accountable is, you know, possible. Thank you, Samuel, for your time today. Thank you to the head, Political Desk, Mainland FM Lagos, Okpeyemi Akinode. Thank you, Akbayemi, for sharing your time thank on you. today. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you, everyone. Good to be here. I hope we keep the conversation going. Yes, I hope so, too. And thanks to elections lead at CJID, Mboho Eno. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you to all the co-panelists. It was a nice conversation. To all those listening, it doesn't stop at elections. It doesn't stop at voting. Life continues. It's not a race. It's not a marathon. It's a lifelong journey. And it's what we give our lives for. So let the conversations continue wherever you are and ensure that we continue to hold those we have put in places of power responsible 
and accountable to us. Thanks for listening and don't forget to catch up on all the live shows right here on africatechradio.com.